here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abram got up. He saddled his donkey, took two of his servants with him, and along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering, set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abram told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther and we will worship there and then we will come right back. So Abram placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them walked on together. Look at that verse again. Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and says, Dad, <laughs> yes, my son, Abraham replied, Dad, we have the fire and we have the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Verse 8, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place, where God had told him to go, Abram built an altar, arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abram picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abram looked up and saw a ram caught by his horns in a thicket. So he took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named the place Yahweh Yira, which means the Lord or Jairo, we sometimes say, the Lord will provide, or the Lord my provider. To this day, people still use that name, that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. That message this morning from the Spirit of God, you know, talking about that mountain that is in front of you, you go ahead and take that mountain, because I'm going to tell you, it's on that mountain that God will provide. It's on that mountain. It's when your faith is being tested. It's when you are, are trying to hear God and God is asking you to do something that is outside of the realm of our understanding that your faith is being tested and God is saying, I need this sacrifice. I need you to step out at this level. And you say, Lord, I don't understand how you're going to pull this off. I don't, I, you know, I don't know all the details. We try sometimes to figure it out in our own mind. But God on that mountain, when you step out in faith, God will provide. He wants to prove himself as Jehovah Jireh into your life. He wants to demonstrate to you that he can provide all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. The topic this morning is the self-sacrificing love of God. The big idea of our message this morning for this service is that God, is sac God sacrificing his son to save us shows just how much he loves us. When we doubt God's love, we can look to the cross and know for sure that he loves us. There's a lot of talk in our culture today about love and what exactly love is. And there's a whole range of gamut of definitions for love. And, you know, people say, well, you, if you agree with me and you let me live my life however I want to live my life, whatever that may mean, if you don't do that for me, that means that you love me. Well, that sounds nice, but that's not true. You know, love sometimes has to be tough. Love sometimes has to be the one that holds your feet to the fire and says, no, you can't do this because this is wrong and because there is a standard and I love you and I'm going to love you even when you're wrong, but my love does not mean that I approve of what you're doing. My love does not mean acceptance. That there's a big difference, right? We love our children even when they do dumb things, even when they disobey us. We don't stop loving them, but we don't approve of their disobedience. We don't approve of what they have chosen to do. We stand firm and we say, no, I love you, but I'm not going to accept what you are doing as normal or moral or ethical. It is still wrong. It will continue to be wrong, but that does not change my love for you. But don't mistake my love for you as agreement with what you're doing or as a stamp of approval on what you're doing. 
So there's a lot of talk in our, our culture, and it's often the discussion is about what we can get out of it. It seems if you truly love somebody, then you're going to let them do or say or believe whatever they want, even when the own, their own result or the end result of their belief system may mean their own destruction. That is not truly love. The focus is not on sacrifice, but rather on self, and rather the enlarging of our own soul, of our own desires. And so people say, well, if you love me, you're going to let me do whatever I want. And that's not what it's about. And so we're going to talk about the sacrifice of love. And, and love always looks to sacrifice, always looks to lay down itself for someone else. And so we look at this morning a challenge to supreme love. As we look at the story of Abraham, there's so much in this story. And God had promised Abraham way back in the beginning when he called him. And he said, Abraham, I want you to leave your family in your hometown. And I want you to go off into the wilderness to a land that I'm going to show you. And so Abraham absolutely just did that and said, okay. He just said, okay. He just did it, which is insane. And, and if you're wondering if there are still people who actually will get up and do exa that exact same thing, there are still people who will do that. And my, one of my friends, I consider friends, one of our missionaries, Chad and Angela Germany, were pastoring a church after coming off the mission field and serving over at Southwestern. They were serving in a church as pastors. And they went to go to a wedding in, in Hawaii. And as they were there, the Lord spoke to them and said, I need you to come here and start a church in the, on the bad side of Hawaii. Not the really nice side of Hawaii, on the bad side of Hawaii. And so they said, okay, Lord. And they went back. They got their everything in order, put their house up for sale, told the church. And within weeks had already packed up everything and had moved to Hawaii without a job. Without having sold their home, with no promise of income whatsoever, they just did what God said. That is faith. And God is still looking for that kind of obedience when God says, hey, I need you to do something for us to just simply obey because to obey is to love. If we love him, Jesus says, we will obey his commands. It's not just the commands that are written in the word, but sometimes God speaks to you something that he will not speak to somebody else. He has not called all of us to sell everything we have and move to Hawaii, although most of us would probably be okay with that. <laughs> I'll go. She's already volunteering. <laughs> Who is this woman? Who, what, what have you done with her? Your wife? I don't know. So God calls to Abraham. That he, you know, he, he goes through this process and he has a son. Uh, by his handmaiden, but that's not the one that God said that was going to bear the promise. It's Isaac. So Isaac is born to his wife who is well past uh, bearing age. She's in her 90s. I believe she was 99. I mean, she's way up there in years. And Isaac means laughter because she laughed when God made the promise, you're going to have a son. And she laughed. And, you know, he said, well, that's what you're going to name your son. You're going to name your son laughter. So Isaac now is a grown, either a, a teenage boy or a young man at this stage when we're reading the story. So it's not just, it's not a little kid. We're not, you're not talking about a three, four-year-old. You're talking about a young, strapping young man. Maybe he's early 20s, 30s. I don't know. But he's there. And one day his father says to him, son, we're going to go make a sacrifice to the Lord on Mount Moriah. And I want you to come with me. So they, they get all the preparations, and as you follow the story along, we know that God has required of Abraham something that is very, very dear to him. Now, if you've never read the book, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer, I read that book every year, and every year is a powerful, powerful story. And so you should get, it's just a small book, buy the book, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer, and you Read it through and then read it again next year and the year after that. Just keep reading. I've been reading it for years. And he, there's a chapter in there where he talks about this uh, very story. And, you know, I just could not even do it justice. But he, he really addresses the struggle that Abraham had with what God is asking him to do. Because God is asking, you know, has asked him to do crazy stuff in the past before. And he did it. But now God is asking him something that is just beyond, you know, something that's like, I mean, this is just wild. This is way beyond what it would be considered normal. But I trust God. And that's the point that Abraham got to a point in his relationship with God all, after all those years where he trusted God and he knew God's voice. Okay. He knew that that was God telling him to do that, even though it sounded crazy. And he just simply decided, I'm going to obey and do what God has called me to do. I don't know how God is going to reconcile all of this together, but I trust God enough to figure it out. That's important. 
I trust God enough to figure it out. So God, Abraham was very wealthy. God had given him a special promise. I will bless you. You will have a son. I will make you into a great nation. And all of, the, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed through you and through your offspring. It was a supernatural blessing. could only be fulfilled by supernatural pro, uh, power. And so at this stage in the game, you know, Abraham is, of course, just enjoying life. And everything is going good. And he's wealthy. And he's prospered. And he has this strapping young man that God had promised him was going to be his heir and so he's he's happy and he's content but God shows up and says I want you to sacrifice your son as an offering to me on Mount Moriah yeah. wow let me tell you something if you're comfortable in your faith that's great get ready <laughs> get ready because our faith is going to be tested. Our faith is going to be challenged. Our love is going to be challenged. And our obedience to God will always be put on the test. As we grow in our relationship to Him, at first the sacrifices are small. And we're, you know, we, we kind of do it. It's hard, but we do them. And as our faith grows stronger and we grow powerful in the things of God and our faith gets bigger and bigger, the sacrifices that will be required of you and I are going to be bigger. Because God is going to stretch your faith and he wants to take you to another level. He doesn't want you to stay where you are and just get comfortable with your faith. But he's going to challenge your faith in one way, shape, or form. We must all be aware that once God has blessed us with, with our most desired possession, that that possession, we have to be careful that it does not take the place of God in our lives. In other words, don't let the blessing overshadow the blessor. Don't let what God has given you take first place in your life. God wants to bless you abundantly, but the most important thing He desires of you is a personal relationship with Him. And when we start allowing other things to take the place of that, we have just substituted one thing for another, and now God is sort of on the back burner, and this thing, we give everything to it, we sacrifice for it, and we now, in a sense, worship it. We don't sing songs to it, I don't think, but our lifestyle and the way we sacrifice demonstrates that we value that above our relationship to God. And A.W. Tozer in the book, I said, The Pursuit of God, in this chapter, The Human Thirst for the Divine, I like that he says here, there is within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They express the real nature of the old Adamic man better than a thousand volumes of theology could do. They are verbal symptoms of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown dead down into things and we dare not pull up one rootlet lest we die. Things have become necessary to us. A development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God and the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution. Wow. You could have said that better. <laughs> You see, God wanted to test Abraham's faith just like God wanted to test your faith and my faith. And I know that you and I, we have had our faith tested throughout the years. I've heard some of your stories, how God has tested your faith and you believed and, and just trusted God and you stepped out of faith and God came through on that mountain of difficulty, on that mountain of sacrifice. Jehovah Jireh showed up and Jehovah himself provided you the strength and the faith and what you needed to make it through that difficulty and that trial. Noah's faith was tested. We know of chapter Hebrews chapter 11, but Noah's faith was tested when he was called to build an ark on dry ground. Abraham was tested by this crazy request for a human sacrifice. Moses' faith was tested by an uncrossable sea and a murmuring multitude. Joseph's, Joshua's faith was tested by having him and the people walk around a massive walled city, believing that God supernaturally would bring the walls down. Joseph's faith was tested by temptation and by prison. Gideon's faith was tested by going into war, by God reducing his army from 30 
32,000 men to 300 men because God kept saying, you've got too many people for me to deliver that army into your hands. A widow's faith was tested when she was starving, and she was tested when the prophet shows up and says, give me that last portion of food in your house first before you feed you and your child your last meal. Give it to me first, for if you do that, God says, you will never have lack. And she believed God. Her faith was tested. Another king's faith was tested when God asked him as he was facing a multitude of an army. He says, I want you to just go out there and dig a bunch of ditches. What? I'm going to deliver you into their hands. All you have to do is go out there in the field and get everybody to dig ditches. What in the world is that all about? <laughs> That's insane. But God came through. David's faith was tested as a young man, a teenager, by a lion, a bear, and then ultimately by a giant. The three Hebrew men were tested by threat of a fiery death if they didn't bow down to worship. Daniel's faith was tested by a hungry den of lions. The Bible says, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. But I'm going to tell you that faith, your faith, will always require another sacrifice because your faith is growing and expanding and it cannot, it must not stay the same. You cannot, your faith must not stay at the level that it's at right now. You may think, oh man, I'm solid. My faith is great. I'm doing good. But I'm going to tell you, the day will come when God's going to come knocking at your door and he's going to say, I need you to step out in faith one more time and I need you to trust me. I need you to believe in me and I need you to lay all that stuff that I blessed you with. I need you to lay it down again because I've got greater things for you and it's going to be your decision and your decision alone whether or not you're going to take that step of faith and walk away from all of that and trust God to provide. Yeah. Without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11 Verses 33 through 38 says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed down in and fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yet moreover a bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Listen, what makes us think that we, the American church, are going to live our Christian life in comfort and at ease when we want our name to be listed in Hebrews chapter? 11. Woo. That got quiet. You know, we want we want to be comfortable. We want to we want to have a relationship with God without sacrifice. We basically want a crossless Christianity where I can where I can manage where I am in control of my faith and you know all that stuff. But then we read you Hebrews chapter 11 and we go, I want to be in that list. Okay, you better read that again when I just read. Because yeah. that's powerful stuff. But we ought to be able, as our faith grows, we ought to be able to look back and say, yes, there were times in my life when my faith was tested through sickness or through disease and God showed up. We're talking about that the other night in our families where God showed up. Talking about my granddaughter Sophia, when God showed up, when the doctors kept saying, we don't know what's wrong with this girl, we got to run more tests, and she kept getting worse and worse, and then God speaks into Sam and Esther and says, you just need to take her home, and I'm going to heal her, she's going to be fine. Well, that goes against, you know, everything that we understand. And the doctor said, you can't take her home. She's still got a fever. She's still throwing up, did all this stuff, and we don't know what's going on with her. And they said, no, we're just going to take her home. They take her home and God heals her, just like that. I mean, just, just better. She gets up the next morning, she's hungry, and just a normal kid. What happened? That was that mountain. God took them to a mountain. 
God took a tomahawk and he says, you need to climb this mountain. And on that mountain, if you'll trust me, I will provide. There is a way that seemeth right unto the man, but they're, in, they're of his death. But God will make a way where there seems to be no way. God wants to test your faith. He wants to stretch your faith. But listen, as hard and as difficult as that was for them, there is another step. There is another level still somewhere out there where God is going to stretch their faith. I don't know when it's going to come for them. I don't know when it's come, going to come for Veronica and I or for you. But all of us, our faith will be tested. Are we ready to demonstrate how much we love God? And are we still willing to sacrifice and lay everything down to follow him? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. You can take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Amen. That's what I'm talking about this morning. God tested Abraham. A sacrifice, a crazy sacrifice was required. Any devotion, any love we proclaim, any allegiance must be proven, confirmed, unquestionably demonstrated beyond any doubt by a sacrifice. I prove my love for my wife on a regular basis. And when we got a brand new baby in our home, I proved my love to her once more. It was a baby lock sewing machine. <laughs> and you don't lie, them things are expensive. I didn't how expensive they were. But I wanted to prove my love for her, right? It's a sacrifice, but I'm going to prove my love. You know, if you love someone, you're going to sacrifice, right? Yes? yes? Oh, yeah. If you're not sacrificing for somebody that you love, then you, do, you have to still kind of start asking yourself, I wonder if I really love this thing or this person. If I'm not sacrificing, if I'm not putting myself out there, because it is impossible to love without sacrifice. The greater our love, the greater the sacrifice. We will do the sacrifice for what we value the most, whatever that may be. And you have to ask yourself, what is it today that you are sacrificing yourself for? Is the dream that you're laying down your life regularly for, is it worth something? Amen. Amen. Matthew 16, 26, Jesus said, for, for what profit is it for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Are there some things or some people that you say are the most valuable in your life, but the sacrifice that you are giving does not measure up to your state of devotion? If you say you love God, but there's no visible sacrifice whatsoever, then you're only fooling yourself. We can talk about it. We can sing about it. We can go through the motions. But if there's no sacrifice in our relationship with God, then we're not really showing our love in any way, shape, or form. The best times to show true love are when it isn't easy and when it requires a personal sacrifice. Abraham simply trusts God. He believes in Hebrews, we are told, that this old man believed that somehow God was going to bring his son Isaac back from the dead. And that's why he was so confident. He said, okay, if God's asking me for my son, and yet God has promised that through this same son, there's going to be a seed. I want to see this. Maybe that's, I don't know if he, he, he if that's how he looked at it or, or what, but Hebrew says that that's how he was able to resolve the conflict in his own heart with what God was asking him to do about sacrificing his own son, that Abraham came to the conclusion and said, God is going to resurrect my son after I sacrifice him because God cannot lie. I know God. I know his character. I trust God. And if he's asking me to do it, he's going to make a way. And when they're walking up the mountain, I love the, the part where it says that he took the wood of the sacrifice and he lays it on his son's shoulders. Woo. And his son says, Dad, you got the fire and the knife. I got the wood. Where's the sacrifice? And what does Abraham say? He didn't say, you're it. <laughs> he didn't say that, did he? He said, God himself shall provide a lamb. God himself. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I've got to follow through on what God has asked me to do all the way to the ugly end. But I'm believing that God is going to do it. And if I have to thrust that knife into the heart of my son, I know that somehow God is going to raise that boy back up because God cannot lie and I can trust him. You see that? 
He resolved that issue in his heart by saying, I trust God, I love God, and I know God's not going to let me down. This may sound crazy. I don't know how God's going to come through for us in this situation. He's asked me to step out in faith and do this or do that. But I know one thing, and that is I can trust God. He hasn't let me in on all the details. He hasn't told me exactly when it's going to happen. He hasn't told me how it's going to happen. But I know him, and I know that he loves me. And he has good plans for my life, not plans to harm me or to hurt me. And I know he's going to see me through. Amen. God stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, saying, Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your only son, your son, your only son. God treats the willingness to sacrifice an only son as the greatest sign of devotion and love. You see, God knew that Abraham absolutely loved and adored that boy, right? He absolutely loved that boy. All his hopes were in that child. And so God just wanted not only for, you know, to, for Abraham to see what he was willing to do to love God. And Abraham proved that his priority was I love and I trust God and then I love this boy. <laughs> he had his priorities right. But when you're talking about Jesus... A sacrifice given. Both Isaac and Jesus are promised children miraculously conceived. Both are explicit, explicitly identified as their father's special one and only son. Both were to be sacrificed by their father. Both were to be sacrificial lambs to God. Both carry the very wood up the hill that they were to be sacrificed on. And both submitted to their father's will to be sacrificed without resisting. Did you think about that? Son, I'm going to put the wood on your back. I've got the fire and I've got the knife. And Isaac said, where is the sacrifice, Dad? I'm not liking this picture. Okay? I'm not liking what's going on here, Dad. I don't know. You've been a little weird lately. What's going on? And they get up, and Abraham, you know, the Isaac lays down the wood. Abraham puts the fire down, and the knife down, starts building an altar out of rocks, builds up a nice altar. And he says, Isaac, come here, buddy. <laughs> what? Come here, Isaac. Get up on that sacrifice. Get up on that altar, boy. You see, it wasn't just Abraham's faith that's being tested. It's Isaac's faith in obedience that's also being tested because he says, I've got to trust my father. And that, oh my gosh, that's a whole other sermon. He said, I'm going to trust my dad. I'm going to trust my dad. And he knows what he's doing. I'm not liking the way this is looking. I'm here. Can you see him uh, tied up, laying on the, on the wood? And, and daddy's got the fire in one hand, you know, so that when he thrusts a knife, he's going to light that fire and, and do this to his son. And Isaac has to sit there. The Bible doesn't tell us what he was thinking. I don't know. I know what I would have been thinking. <laughs> if somebody's going to die today, Daddy, it's not going to be me. <laughs> right? But he got up there willingly. I guarantee you, I, uh, Abraham was too old to pick that boy up now and lay him on the altar. He had to tell him, son, I need you to get up on this altar. Wow. He had to willingly say, I'm going to trust my dad. He, I think he's lost it, but I'm going to trust God. <laughs> because of all the stories my daddy has told me about God, how God has come through in his life, I'm going to trust. I'm going to put my faith in that same God. And I don't know how God's going to pull this off, but I'm going to do what my dad has asked me to do. That's insane. But his faith was tested. But he gets up on that wood. Dad rears up that knife and is about to go down with it. And the angel stops him. He says, don't lay a hand on that boy. When he looks up, there's a ram caught in the thicket. Wow. You see, God provided. It may have been not when they were going up the mountain. He didn't provide days before. He didn't provide when he was building the altar. He didn't provide when he had laid the wood on the altar. He didn't provide even when Isaac was tied up already on top of the altar, but it was when that knife was about to come down. Right at that very last second, that very last moment, that God stepped in and provided. See, we want God to provide on the way up to the mountain. We want God to provide. Lord, I'm going to follow you, but can I, can I see something over there that, oh, okay, so I can feel better about my obedience to you, so I can feel better about my sacrifice. Can you show me some shiny little stuff over there on the other side so I can feel good that you're going to provide? But then it's not faith, is it? 
It's not faith if we see the end result. Faith is trusting God that he loves me. And he's going to provide. And he's asked me to step out in faith and to sacrifice because of, I, I say that I love him. And I want to prove that to God. The difference is that as we look at this story that Isaac is a type of Christ, but except for one point, Isaac was spared and a sacrificial lamb was given to take his place. The substitutionary ram is a picture of Jesus. When Jesus was given as our sacrifice, there was no other that could ever take his place. The love of God was demonstrated by his act of sacrificing his son for us on the cross of Calvary. True love is only communicated by sacrificial love. Let me read this illustration. Does God really love us? I say look to the crucified Jesus. Look to the old rugged cross. By every thorn that punctured his brow. By every mark on the back lacerating scourge. By every hair of his beard plucked from his cheeks by cruel fingers. By every bruise which heavy fists made upon his head. God said I love you. By all the spit that landed on his face. By every drop of sinless blood that fell to the ground. By every breath of pain which Jesus drew upon the cross. And by every beat of his loving heart. God said, I love you. Our love for others will not be communicated effectively by our clever treats, our social media posts, our constant demands for our rights, or by our political party affiliation. But our love for others can only be effectively communicated by our acts of sacrifice for those who deserve it the least and yet need it the most. Do I need to say that again? Okay, I'll say it again. Our love for others will not be communicated effectively by our clever treats, our social media posts, our constant demands for our rights, or by our political party affiliations. But our love for others can only be effectively communicated by our acts of sacrifice for those who deserve it the least and yet need it the most. Too often we are more than willing to let others sacrifice so we can get what we want. The world plays that same game, but it's past time that the church realizes that we cannot win the world for Jesus by playing their games. We've got to live on another level. We've got to live by a love that is a sacrificial love, sacrificing one for the other, following the example of our Heavenly Father who gave us that example of sacrificing His own Son. And He says, as I have loved you, now you need to turn around and love others. And Jesus said, by all this one, men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It didn't say they're going to know that you're my disciples by your cute little posts on social media. They're going to know that you're my disciples because you're packing heat. They're going to know that you're my disciples because you dress a certain way or you talk a certain way or sing a certain kind of genre of worship music. He says they're going to know that you're my disciples because why? How we love one another and if we truly love one another if I love you and I say I love you and you say you love me, then we have to be willing as a church family to sacrifice for one another the way God sacrificed for us. And as long as we are laying down our lives for each other as a church family and for those who are not part of the church family, maybe even more importantly, that is how the world would know that we are His disciples. That is the proof of our love. That is the proof of my love for him and my love for you. Jesus took all the law and he said, I'm going to ball it all up into two things. You know that. He said, I'm going to take all the rules and regulations and everything else that you think is out there. I'm going to just ball it up into two tiny little things. Love the Lord your God with all your hope, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, we'll sacrifice yourself. We'll work overtime for self. We'll put it on the credit card for self. We'll beg, borrow, and have to steal for self. We'll do whatever we have to do for self. We primp, we crimp, we wash, we bathe, we decorate, we clothe, we do whatever we have to do to be comfortable, to be beautiful, to be young, to be strong, whatever it is for self. But it's when we do it for somebody else that we demonstrate the love of Jesus. John, as I close, let's have the praise team come up. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Thank you, Jesus.